And it looks like we're on YouTube now. And I'm going to go ahead and start the recording. Blue record on this computer. And this is the Male Entrepreneur Podcast, episode number 119. Is that right? Yep, 119. 119. And we are live. In three, two. All right. Welcome back to the Male Entrepreneur Podcast with your host, Pradeep Sangha. Pradeep, how are you doing today? Man, personally, I'm I'm pretty phenomenal. I'm doing great. I'm having an awesome day. It's actually my son's birthday today. So we're getting geared up for that. I got a couple of meetings and then we're gonna spend the afternoon and evening um just having some fun. So he's excited, looking forward to that. Nice. How old is he gonna be? It's going to be seven, man. It is crazy how kids grow. It is just nuts. <laughs> you know, it's, it seems like yesterday I, I laugh because my wife and I have this running joke when, uh, so my son was 10 days, um, you can say uh, a little bit late. He had a C-section. So he was in there for a while. He was actually a big baby too. And so he was a big baby. He had this big cone head because he was kind of stuck down there for a bit and he was wrinkly. And I, when, when the doctor pulled him out and gave him to me, I was just looking at him like, this is my kid. Like, cause I just laughed. Cause I was just like, I didn't expect a baby to look like this. Cause he was just so different. And it was hilarious. Cause I, my wife and I just laughed. He's he was like a little gnome, right? Cause he had a little pointy head and he's just funny looking. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's hilarious. And now he's, now he's seven years old, man. And it's uh man, just, it's incredible to see kids grow like that. Is he your oldest? He is the eldest. Yeah. Okay, man. Um, I have a little one as well. And one of the things that has been weighing on me lately is uh, she's 11 and I'm, I'm concerned about how everything that's going on in the world right now is going to affect her growing up. Um, I think things that happen when you're young tend to, if we don't process them and if we don't work through them, they have a tendency to affect us way later on into life. And, um, you asked before we started the show, how's it going today, Nathan? And I was like, ah, oh, life is life because it's good. And I'm in a much better position than a lot of people are, uh, as far as like finances and, and work and stuff like that goes. But, um, some of the conversations that we've been having lately have, have kind of, it's things that I wouldn't think an 11 year old kid or, or maybe even a seven year old kid would have to ever be worried about or thinking about. And yeah, I don't know, man. I, that's why when he asked me before the show, how things are going, I was like, well, life is life. Yeah, man, there's a lot happening. And I think that's why uh, we're, this episode is really dedicated to that. I think this is going to be the first episode that you'll probably hear me swear a lot because there's so much going on, Nathan. I'm so I'm not even I'm not angered. I'm so disappointed because it, you know, it's getting to such a point that it's almost total chaos right now. And it, obviously, a majority of the stuff that's happening around the world, we had, we got COVID on one hand, we got all the crap that's going on with that. Now we have the civil unrest with, with what's happening in the US. And it's actually trickling up here in Canada as well. We've had a number of protests, uh, which I was surprised about. Uh, some of them have gotten to the point where, you know, there was rioting and there was looting. Um, not to the degree that is happening in the U.S., but now this this has to come to an end. Like it is just so ridiculous right now. I'm all for protesting. I'm all for peaceful protests. I think there has to be major reform when it comes to inequality. You and I have talked about this for a long time. You know, we've come from uh, different backgrounds, but we've experienced racism. We've experienced being stereotyped. We've um, you know we've experienced injustice, for example, but. For the level to, uh, you know, where it's at right now, for people to be looting places, for people to be, you know, people are getting shot out there now. And unfortunately, you know, I'm not, I'm going to say this straight up, you know, a lot of cops are, 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 you know, shouldn't be cops. Let's put it in the first place, right? They shouldn't be cops. They shouldn't be allowed to be in the police force. They shouldn't be allowed to be, you know, people in public figures protecting other people. It's just ridiculous in terms of who they hire. But now we're, we're hurting the people that are out there protecting the people as well. Like the vast majority of cops I'm hoping are good people. We've got a number of dickheads, um, but that has to change. And I've, I've experienced this myself and I'll share personal examples. I've been, I've been thrown 
in the, the the drunk tank, you can say twice in my younger age. And both was based on, from my experience, personal uh, profile, basically racial profiling, right? We were the brown guys and, you know, you kind of pick them up and just kind of throw them in. I'll share one quick, I'll share one quick uh, story here, Nathan. It's kind of funny. So me and my buddies, there's three of us, we go into this club and they were very strict in terms of um, brown people there. Because uh, if you're a brown person, you were considered a kind of like a gangbanger, right? In, in Vancouver, British Columbia and Canada. And they would actually swipe your IDs before you went into the club. So they had a record of who's coming in and who's leaving and that kind of stuff. So we went into this club, they swiped our IDs and right behind us were three cops. And so as we got into the, uh, the club, the cops immediately came up to us and said, we want to see your IDs. And we said, well, why? What's the issue? And they said, well, you know, you're in a licensed establishment. We want to make sure that you guys um, have the proper ID. And we're like, you were right behind us when we got ID'd. They swiped it. You guys were right behind us. You saw that. They wouldn't have let us in if we didn't have the proper IDs. So we said, we're not going to give it to you because we just didn't want to. And we were kind of smart asses too, right? And so they said, okay, out you guys go. We're taking you guys in. And we're like, what? So I got a little bit lippy too. I said, you know what? I know my rights. You have zero right to be able to, you know, first of all, kick us out of here. And second, arrest us because we did nothing wrong. Well, they threw me in the paddy wagon. And they basically said, you know what, you're, you're going to the drunk tank tonight. And I basically said, I'm not even drunk. I didn't even have a drink. <laughs> so what are you <laughs> going to throw me in for? <laughs> right? And so the couple was being a real dick. And so I sat there. And one of the, one of the guys that uh, I actually used to work out with ends up, uh, he's a cop. And he's an Indian guy. And he came up and he's like, Pradeep, man, what are you doing here? He's like, what did you do? I said, I did nothing. And he's like, I know you're a good guy. You know, you don't deserve to be here. So he's like, let me just talk to the guys and I'll come back. So we went and he talked to guys and he came back and he said, you know what? I talked to the guy who just happened to be a white police officer. And he said, all you need to do is apologize. And I said, apologize for what? And he said, just apologize. He's like, just, you know, all you need to say is say sorry. I'm like, I didn't do anything wrong. In all honesty, I did zero, like nothing wrong whatsoever. He's the one that's kind of oh, stepping over his, his, his boundaries. And he said, just say sorry. I said, okay, fine, send him over. So the guy walks up and I, he's like, I heard you got something to say to me. And I, at, right at that moment, I knew because he was being totally cocky. I said, yeah. I said, fuck you. That's <laughs> what I got to say to you. And, he, <laughs> and he, he slammed the door shut and uh, away I went for the night. It was a really interesting experience because, um, uh, you know, it's just a lot. It was just not a fun experience. I didn't like spending the, the, the night in jail, but it just, you know, I've experienced this myself. I haven't gotten to the degree where it's been, you know, physically violent or beat up or anything like that by cops. My, my friends have. Um, but I just thought that was a funny story to share because uh, I think there's a lot of that that does happen out there as well. Yeah. And I think that you nailed it earlier on when you said not all of them are bad. And we, I mean, the anarchist in me doesn't want to say this, but when I look around, some people acting like spoiled children makes me think, well, maybe we do need somebody out there to protect us, to protect our businesses, to protect our homes, stuff like that. But it has been my experience also that positions of power tend to attract people who aren't very good people. And I don't think it's just police. I, I mean, when you look at um, child molesters usually are attracted to jobs at like preschools and places where they'll have power over children, uh, Hollywood, stuff like that. Um, people who are abusers, people who are um, just not good people, are they tend to be attracted to positions of power. And I don't think that we are willing, as a society, I don't think that we're willing to have that conversation about, hey, we need to do a better job of vetting the people that we give power. Or maybe we shouldn't be giving people this much power in general, because it seems like over and over again, these positions of power end up getting filled with people that we shouldn't be trusting with this kind of power. Well, I think you just nailed it. I think the vetting process is the most important thing. The voting process is one of the biggest things. And what we've done is we have given too much power. And I'm a firm believer. You, Nathan and I, you and I, we've talked about this. We've debated about 
this for a while, right? That whole topic of your president right now. Um, and I, I firmly believe, you know, it's time to take him down because he doesn't know how to deal with a situation like this. And I don't mean physically take him down or take him out from that standpoint, but he doesn't, he just knows how to, he, he doesn't understand unity. He just understands separation. And we need a strong leader right now, but this is, it's, it's beyond that now. It is such it, one person in power like that. It, it, he, he doesn't even have the ability to change what we need to change. It starts at the ground level. I've seen different videos. I've di seen different live coverages in terms of what's happening. We have two camps, right? One is actually three camps. One is that they're, they're protesting and they're doing it in a nonviolent way, right? They have, they're, they're out there. They are, presenting themselves in a way that, yes, they're angry, but they know that violence is, isn't going to be the key. Then we have the key camp out there that's just completely out there looting. And they're, they're the ones that are just to causing total anarchy. They're the ones that are ripping people off and, and breaking into stores and, and being violent and shooting and all that other kind of stuff. And then we have a camp that's angry and they're protesting, but they're also using a little bit of violence and they're, they're, they're pushing their boundaries from that standpoint. What we need is just true leadership because I've seen some of these, even these camps collide, right? We have nonviolent protesters colliding with the violent protesters saying, what are you doing? This is just perpetuating the situation. Hate does not dissolve hate. Hate only perpetuates hate. You know, and I put a post out the other, I think it was yesterday maybe saying, you know, what's the biggest thing that we are teaching our children? We are teaching our children to perpetuate this hate. Because as you said, our younger, like your, your daughter that you're talking about, 11 years old, she is very easily influenced. And they don't have the capacity to be able to process this information. They just are running on emotions, right? Yes, they do have logic, but it's not fully mature yet. So what are, are we teaching our kids? There's people out there that, and I, this is the funniest shit ever that I'm experiencing. Uh, of, of all kinds of people that are jumping on this bandwagon now, when it comes to Black Lives, Lives Matter, um, they've never stood up for any racial equality in their entire lives. They've never experienced it in their entire lives. Yet now it's a huge thing for them because it's become this, this thing, this moral thing to jump on and support, right? So it's really interesting to see people's behavior. At the end of the day, when we have all this chaos, there's zero communication, right? It's just emotions out there. This is, and again, these are just my personal beliefs. These are just my personal beliefs based on my life experience and what I've seen. Um, cause I've experienced a lot of racism growing up and I, I still remember it to the day, you know, when I switched schools in grade two, I went to a school that I was like the only Brown kid at that school at that particular time I was, and everybody, when they heard my name, they're like, Pradeep, what's a Pradeep? <laughs> and they made fun of it for the, literally they made fun of it for the first two days. And I remember that and that stuck with me. Right. So I understand the challenges that people are facing. Obviously, people losing their lives is a completely different degree. But I don't believe that this is going to the, uh, the violent protests are going to end up in a good situation for the U.S. But what I'm asking, I think ultimately what I'm saying is that we require two things right now. We require leadership and we require unity. And there's people out there. This, this starts, it stems with the people that have positions of power, but it also stems from, from parents, from people like you and I right, that have kids, you know, there's people out there that have teenagers that are out there in the riots, right, that are either looting or doing whatever or being, you know, a physically violent, you need to rein back your kids, right, you need to rein back yourself, first of all, to be able to do something, but I can't preach because I'm not in that situation, I can't be, I, I can't tell anybody what to do or what not to do, I'm just expressing my personal viewpoints, because I'm seeing, um, and Nathan, I'm saying this as a neighbor, right? I live in Canada. My business is in the U.S. I have family in the U.S. But I feel like I'm seeing my neighbor go down and go down real fast and real hard. And there's not much I can do about it except for, you know, share my thoughts and opinions through these conversations. So I'm going to add a little bit of, I think, breadth to the conversation. Um, my daughter is, or stepdaughter, she's Mexican. Her mom is Mexican. I grew up in a Mexican household, but, um, I'm, I pass as white. People look at me and they, they think that I'm white. People who know me tend to not think I'm white, but people who just look at me think I'm white. Um, we were having a conversation the other day and she asked me, how come people on the internet think that it's okay to hate you? 
just because you're white and why do keep why do people keep people keep saying that all white people are racist me and mama are mexicans and you've never been racist to us and i think that one of the things that makes it impossible for this situation to actually be solved is the fact that white people are the only ones being asked to address their racism and i grew up in la i grew up in a mexican household and i grew up in predominantly black and mexican neighborhoods Racism is not a white person thing. Racism exists in all races. And right now, the only people being asked to look at their own racism is white people. And if white people are the only ones that do it, it's not going to solve the problem. And then you're going to have a lot of the racists who are white using that as a reason to double down in their own hatred. They're going to be like, well, uh, white people are victims too and white genocide. And, and it seems like by only pointing the spotlight on the racism in the white community, it seems like it's going to just make the problem worse because it gives the racists in the white community ammo for their argument. And it doesn't actually address the fact that racism exists in other communities as well. Yeah, I, I, such a valid point, man. You're absolutely right. I laugh because I'm like, yeah, Indians, they're racist. You know, the Chinese, they're racist too. Everybody, you know, has their own stereotypes. Bang on point. I um, I would suggest to everybody watch a little bit of Russell Peters because you'll find out how racist each each race really is, right? Because it's it's true. Uh, I think I think we as a society should probably do that. I think that's one of the solutions. Throw a bunch of white, brown, Chinese, black people into a room, Mexican, and say, hey, watch Russell Peters, right? And everybody come together, laugh at each other. I think, I think we need more of that. Uh, tensions, tensions are just really high. Uh, man, I, I, I feel for you because it's not just white people. And it's not, it's not a white people problem. It's an everybody problem. It's a unity problem. Um, I think people, for personally as well, we naturally have a stereotype for different colors, different races, different people. That's just our human beings, right? That's just how we evolve. That's how our brain works. Um, but we have to get past that. And I think there's just so many emotions that are just flying really deep right now that people just aren't thinking and they're, and they're just being in the moment. Um, I, you know, if I was to say, you know, what, what do we need to change this? I really don't know. I really don't know what we need to to do to change this, whether it's a political party, whether it's, you know, more diverse, um, you can say communities, you know, one of the things in my local community, here's what they did, they started busing kids from poor neighborhoods to different neighborhoods, from higher end neighborhoods to more poor neighborhoods to kind of bring kids together. And what they found was that didn't do shit because those families still had their same opinions and viewpoints. And so I think it starts at the household level. I truly do believe it starts at the household level. If we're more tolerant in our families of people, if we have conversations, like you said, I, you know, I'm not gonna point the finger at, at parents, but I think parents are the biggest reason why we are where we are um, beyond media, behind all, that, all those other things. Because if I look back at my childhood and I say, you know, I, I was exposed to all of these different kinds of things. I was exposed to drugs and all, you know, drug dealing, all that kind of stuff. Why didn't I do it? Because of my family. I didn't do it because my family taught me different. I didn't do it because I was going to go home and I would have, uh, my dad would have kicked the crap out of me, right? I, that's just the reality of the situation. And so I think it does stem at the family level. I think we do as, as parents, and I'm so glad to hear you talk about that, Nathan, to have those open conversations with our kids, regardless of how old they are and say, okay, are we, are we teaching our kids the right things? I think we completely overlook that. Nathan, and I, I know we're kind of going off topic here, but I, I think we completely overlook our power and our influence as parents. And yeah. sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I agree with you. I think that like most issues, it starts with taking ownership of our, our own actions and our own uh, spheres of influence. A lot of times we want the world to change. We want those people over there to change. And we don't ask ourselves, well, what can we change in ourselves and in our families and in our homes to actually impact the world around us? We just, we want them to change. And I think you're, I think you're spot on correct. 
Yeah, it's 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 funny because my 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 parents when things used to go downhill, um, when it when I ever got in trouble or did something that I shouldn't have when I was younger, you know what? My parents looked at me first and said, "What the heck did you do?" <laughs> you know what? We got to fix this first, and we got to fix you first before we fix anything else out there. And I think there's two types of parents out there in the world. They're the parents that look internally and say, what's, what do we need to change internally in terms of our household, how we're parenting? And then there's the parents that blame everybody else. I see that a lot these days and it pisses the hell out of me. I see kids and forget about racism and all that kind of stuff. Just kids are so entitled these days. You know, just the way they, they have, I'm not going to say total stereotype, but the work ethic has, you know, it's, it seems like me to me, they've, it's plummeted. The entitlement is shot up. Um, all of this kind of crap is just kind of adding up to where we're at right now. And then you feel, feel on racism and you feel on all, all, all this other stuff. Uh, we just need to come together. I think we just need to have an open conversation. There needs to be stronger leaders out there. That's why, again, that's why this podcast is about. I'm a firm believer. I, you know, I put out a couple of posts on LinkedIn, for example, and I directed it specifically to men. And then there's people out there, there's uh, comments from men saying, yeah, what about the women? And what about this? And, I, and here's my thought. That's the very reason why we're in this kind of mess in the first place. Because if men can't stand up for themselves and stand up for their women and be like, well, what about the women? What about, get your ass together, Right. And honestly, there's too many, I'm going to say this straight up, too many pussy guys out there that aren't taking accountability for their families, aren't taking accountability for their kids and want this kumbaya, whatever it is, life without actually having to do something about it. It's time we stand up. If we see people out there rioting, let's have a conversation. Obviously, let's not put ourselves in harm's way, but let's just have an honest conversation about this. Open conversation is what's going to change this, for, starting with the men. Mm -hmm. If you take a look out there, it, we got to get the men uh, all aligned when it comes to this kind of stuff. I'm, I honestly, this is total sexism. And you can, you can point the fingers at me for this. I'm not afraid of a bunch of women out there rioting and looting. I'm afraid of men. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple women that I'm afraid of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. maybe. <laughs> but I, I, I see your point. Pretty <laughs> I agree with you though. These conversations need to be happening. I, that's why I like having this time with you each week to have these conversations. Um, and I know the listeners appreciate it as well. If they want to check out more, where can they go to hear more of these kind of conversations? <laughs> again, again, uh, Nathan, I'm going to send them to your website. <laughs> Copy and no, I'm just kidding. Um, you, YouTube for men.com um, and mailpodcast.com. If you feel like you got to throw out some hate mail, I'll give you my personal email address as well. You can send it to coach at perdeepsanga.com. In all honesty, I'm more than happy to hear from you. But um, I, I, I hope this has impacted you in some way that you feel like you have you have opportunity uh, and a need to actually move forward and do something different. Well, I just want to say thank you for being willing to have an honest and open discussion in a time where emotions seem to be ruling the day and uh, we need more of it. All right, man. Until next time, I will catch you later. If there is a next time.